Hi, welcome to this MCQ Revision Blast. We're going to look at biopsychology for this particular set of questions. So how it works is going to be 15 questions. I'm going to read through each one. Pause the video when I finish reading through. Give you a bit of time to think about your answer. Like I said, it's going to be 15 questions. Keep your score as you go along. Question one. What is wrong with this diagram? A. The PNS and CNS are mixed up. B. SNS and PNS are mixed up. C. The CNS divisions are incorrect. D. The ANS and somatic are mixed up. So take your time, pause the video. Right, the correct answer that I'm looking for there is the ANS, that's to say the autonomic nervous system and the somatic nervous system are mixed up. So if we have a look at the diagram where we've got the peripheral nervous system is divided into two different branches. What we have coming off the somatic nervous system there is the parasympathetic and the sympathetic branches and we know that those should be the branches that come off the autonomic nervous system so not the somatic so understanding the structure of the nervous system is absolutely integral of course as well as understanding what the different parts of the nervous system do question two what key term would go where the star is on this diagram? So if you have a look there, there's a little blue star, and I just like to know out of A, B, C, and D, which term you think would be used to label that particular part of a neuron. So pause your video. Right, the correct answer that we're looking for there is that is the dendrite. We've also got some other kind of missing terms on there that we can fill in. So we've got the cell body of the neuron. Um, obviously, the synapse is part of synaptic transmission. So we wouldn't actually see the synapse unless that neuron was there connecting with another neuron. And of course, we've got the myelin sheath on as well there. So of course, there's three different types of neuron that you're required to know. The sensory neuron, the motor neuron and the relay neuron. Run. You're expected to know the functions of the neuron and also what this points to is the structure of the neuron as well as being able to tell the difference between them and describe the difference between those types of neurons. Question 3. Which statement about synaptic transmission is not accurate? Inhibition is where the postsynaptic neuron is less likely to fire. Excitation is where the postsynaptic neuron is more likely to fire. Summation is the adding up of postsynaptic potentials to determine whether or not a neuron will fire. The reuptake mechanism is located on the receptors of the postsynaptic neuron. We pause the video. Okay, it's D there that's not correct, and this is a tricky question. So we'll just start there. We've got two terms. We've got excitation and inhibition. Excitation and inhibition are both terms that you are expected to know. Now, related to them, we've got this kind of golden term, if you like, C. So if I am describing synaptic transmission and making reference to inhibition and excitation, I've got to use the word summation because summation is basically what brings it all together. Because summation, like it says in the word, this summing, this adding up, is basically the deciding of whether or not a postsynaptic neuron is going to fire. And that's based on a calculation of what uh, impulses incoming are inhibitory, what impulses incoming are excitatory. If I have more excitatory impulses than inhibitory, then the postsynaptic neuron will create an action potential. And if I have more inhibitory than excitatory, it will not. So it's basically an all or nothing process in that respect. Question four, which glands of the endocrine system are starred on this diagram? So look at those little stars. Is it thyroid and pancreas, testes and thyroid, pituitary and pancreas, ovaries and pituitary? So take a time, pause the video. OK, what I'm looking for there is answer A in the sense that we should have the thyroid gland and the pancreas. So this diagram is pretty nice because it just details the kind of key uh, endocrine glands. Of course, what you're going to have to uh, be required to know about the endocrine glands is uh, what they are, what hormones they produce and also the related effects of those hormones. All right, so which hormones are released from the thyroid and pancreas? Is it A, adrenaline and melatonin? B, thyroxine and insulin? 
or C, cortisol, sorry, cortisol and testosterone. Pause your video. Right, your correct answer there should be B, that's thyroxine and insulin. Now for A, that's adrenaline and melatonin. So adrenaline is uh, produced from the adrenal medulla, which is part of the adrenal gland. Melatonin, that big sleep hormone, is produced from the pineal gland, also known as the third eye. Um, C, we've got cortisol and testosterone. Cortisol is produced from the adrenal cortex, also part of the adrenal gland. And testosterone, of course, is produced from the testes. So just to reiterate what I said there in the last slide, just make sure you know your endocrine glands, you know the hormones they produce and also the functions of those hormones. Okay, which of these would not be a valid evaluation of the fight or flight response? We have A, it considers the response of males and females. B, it doesn't consider the freeze response. C, there may be a beta bias. So pause your video. Right, the correct answer there that I'm looking for is A. And A, of course, is linked to C, this idea that there's a beta bias from the fight or flight response. So what does it mean that it does a, doesn't consider the response of males and females? We often talk about the fight or flight response and this idea of the adrenaline giving individuals the ability to kind of fight and face this particular scenario or run away. But the information that we know about the fight or flight response has come from a lot of research evidence that was based on male animals. And in that sense, you can argue that we actually learn, know little about how females respond to stress. And you've probably used the term tend on friend in your evaluations, which is a strategy that has been shown to be adopted by females, which is, of course, different from this fight or flight response. We've also got B here when we talk about the fight or flight response that it doesn't consider the freeze response, and that's true. This is the third F, if you like, because there is another response to a stressful situation where an individual does freeze, um, which may seem maladaptive in a sense, but you could argue that the reason that individuals freeze in these situations might be if they don't make any noise and make any movement, they're not gonna draw attention to themselves. So in that respect, the big saber toothed tiger that they're facing might not notice them. Question seven, which area of the brain does the star on the diagram represent? We've got the motor cortex, the somatosensory cortex, the visual cortex, or the auditory cortex. So what is the star? Okay, we've got the correct answer there that you should have got was the somatosensory cortex, which you see is right next to the mind motor cortex. They're just separated, of course, by that central sulcus. Now, these are areas of the brain you are required to know where they are. So a potential question like we've just had here in terms of labeling a diagram, and you will also be able to be required to describe what they actually do. That's to say, what is their function? Eight. Students tend to write the worst evaluation for A, fMRI, B, EEG, C, ERP, or D, post-mortem. So pause the video. Right, correct answer there is D. So obviously these are the different ways of studying the brain that are listed on the specification. Now, the reason we flagged up post-mortem here is because basically it's been flagged up as the exam. Uh, the comment being made that the evaluations you are writing about post-mortem are very, very anecdotal. And you're saying little beyond the idea that, oh, it's a problem because the person having the post-mortem can't give consent because they are dead. Of course, for your fMRI, your EEG, or your REP, you're writing some amazing evaluations where you're comparing the difference in terms of temporal resolution and spatial resolution. So it's certainly a little bit of a red flag area. So think carefully about the evaluation that you're going to use post-mortem studies because you're going to have to go beyond saying issues of consent because they are dead. Question nine. Which one of these statements accurately describes the difference between an fMRI and an EEG? So we've got fMRIs have accurate spatial resolution, whereas EEGs have less accurate spatial resolution. B, fMRIs have accurate temporal resolution, where EEGs have less accurate temporal resolution. 
So pause your video. Right, the correct answer here that I'm looking for is A. Now, this was a point that I raised in the last slide in terms of the evaluation. Now, the linking into the temporal and spatial resolution differences between fMRI and EEGs is a great way to evaluate them, but it's also a good way to approach a question where you're asked to outline how two different mechanisms of study in the brain are different. So we've got the fMRI here. So fMRIs have good spatial resolution, but bad temporal resolution. What that means is they can tell me where something's happening in your brain, that spatial resolution, but the time period that it's happening there tends to be a lag on. EEGs are the reverse of that. They've got bad spatial resolution. So in terms of locating exact areas in the brain, they're not great. But in terms of telling me when that thing happens, that's the temporal, they're very, very good at that. 10. Which of these statements is not accurate? A. The somatosensory area is in the parietal lobe. B. The visual area is in the occipital lobe. C. Broca's area is in the left temporal lobe. D. The auditory area is in the temporal lobe. So pause your video. OK, so we're back to the brain um, for this question, just again again to demonstrate the importance of really understanding the locations of these. So the correct answer we're looking for there is, so the incorrect answer is C, sorry. So we've got Broca's area is in the left temporal lobe. Broca's area is in the left frontal lobe. And then you've got Wernicke's area, which is in the left temporal lobe. So although Broca's area and Wernicke's area are both located in the left uh, hemisphere, they are located at different areas in the left hemisphere. And that's going to be very valuable to you if you are asked to comment on the work of Broca or indeed Wernicke. 12. Marie has fallen down the stairs and she's unable to move the right side of her body and she is struggling to talk. What might Maria's brain show us? A. She's damaged her right frontal lobe. B. She's damaged her left frontal lobe. C. She has damaged Wernicke's area. D. She has damaged her occipital lobe. So pause your video. Right, the correct answer here that I'm looking for is B. So remember the frontal lobe where we, where we have the motor area and also where we've got Broca's area. Broca's area, of course, is about speech production. Now, I put the word contralateral on here just in case you're wondering is why she can't move the right side of her body if she damaged her left hemisphere. So basically, basically contralateral control means that the left hand side of the brain controls the motor movement on the right hand side of the body and the right brain controls the motor movement on the left hand side of the body. So if I damage the left side of my brain, it will affect the right side of my body because that's just basically how our brains are wired. All right, Sperry's research demonstrated that. I'd like you to select two of these, please. We've got A, participants were unable to verbally describe images presented to their left visual field. B, participants were unable to verbally describe images presented to their right visual field. C, participants could not describe objects placed in their right hand. And D, participants could not describe objects placed in their left hand. So I just want you to take your time and I want to know which two of these did Sperry's research demonstrate. Pause the video. OK, the correct answer that I'm looking for there is A and D. So what I've done on the screen there is I've just put the detail of the two different tasks there where they were describing by Sperry. So it's basically the describe what you see task. And this, remember, is where they had a picture presented to either their right visual field or their left visual field and they were simply just asked to verbally describe what they see and then we've also got the results here of the tactile test so the tactile test is where they are asked to feel a particular object and describe what they felt uh, part of the tactile test of course is um, after describing what they felt they can also given the option where with their hand they can pick an object that's similar to it Question 13. Which two statements below relate to ultradian rhythms? A. They last longer than 24 hours. B. 
They last shorter than 24 hours. C. Stages of sleep is an example. D. The menstrual cycle is an example. So which two statements below relate to ultradian rhythms? Pause the video. Now the correct answer here is B and C. Uh, what we've done on there, there is sometimes a little bit of confusion between infradian and ultradian rhythms. So A and D there are what infradian rhythms are. So the infradian rhythms, of course, are the cycles that occur at a period more than 24 hours. So the menstrual cycle is an example of this, of course, occurring uh, as a monthly cycle. And then those that occur at a frequency less than 24 hours, the example that we often use is the stages of sleep because of course during sleep we switch between the kind of REM and the non-REM stages of sleep um, at quite a quick frequency so it kind of tends to be on a 90 minute cycle with flipping between these four different stages of sleep that there are. Okay which of these statements about the suprachiasmatic nucleus is false? We've got A it's an endogenous pacemaker, B it lays within the hypothalamus, C it receives information from the optic nerve, well, D, it has little effect on biological rhythms, right? So which one of those is false? Pause your video. Okay, the correct answer there is D, that it has little effect on biological rhythms. Of course, it has a huge effect on biological rhythms, in particular, the circadian rhythm. I've just put a diagram there on your slide there in terms of how the suprachiasmatic nucleus actually works in, how, in terms of how it translates information from the environment into the hormone melatonin, of course, which is responsible for your sleep. 15. When researchers bred hamsters with an abnormal circadian rhythm of 20 hours and translated neurons from their SCN into normal hamsters, which of these happened? Was it A, the hamsters became superheroes? B, the hamster's circadian rhythm stayed the same? C, the hamster's circadian rhythm changed to 20 hours? Or D, animal rights groups complained? Pause your video. Now, the correct answer here is C, and it was the hamster circadian rhythm changed to 24 hours. So this is a piece of research that you may or may not be familiar with, um, where they bred hamsters to have an abnormal circadian rhythm, like it says there, of 24 hours. And then they put this abnormal circadian rhythm via neurons into normal hamsters, basically just to see what happens. And of course, it demonstrates the power of the suprachiasmatic nucleus as this endogenous pacemaker. All right, so we're done now for biopsych. Uh, there is another biopsych MCQ revision blast on here if you want to have a go at it. If you're struggling with anything, there's uh, plenty of study notes on tutortou.net. Indeed, as well, there are plenty of other MCQ revision blasts on here for all of the other topics that you may have studied. Good luck.